Okay, I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the EPs here at Mount Sinai. And I've been asked to talk about perioperative considerations and electrophysiologist perspective. So I was going to talk about maze and left atrial appendage closure and then the role of CRT or potential role of CRT and mitral valve surgery. I'll try and keep this kind of short. So this is a, uh, a case of a 61-year-old male. Who's actually, I've been following him now for about five years. One of the first patients ever saw me as an outpatient when I became an attending. Uh, he had symptomatic severe MR and persistent AFib, and he was planned for a mitral valve repair a couple of years ago. In the prior two years, he had failed two antiarrhythmics, <laughs> sodolol and amiodarone, and he had undergone three prior cardioversions. And usually his AF came back within a few weeks. Um, and he didn't want ablation at that time. So his surgeon at the time of the consult recommended that he undergo a left atrial appendage exclusion and maze at the time of his valve surgery. So he came back to the office. He had seen a few different surgeons, and he wanted to know should he go undergo these, quote, add-on procedures, and wh uh, whether they will render him arrhythmia-free and obviate the need for anticoagulation. Because from a patient perspective, not having to be on Coumadin or any of the NOACs for life would be great. So really what he's asking is, does left atrial appendage exclusion reduce the risk of stroke from a surgical perspective? And does surgical ablation effectively treat AFib? And so this is at least my perspective of it. So if you look at the ACC AHA guidelines, just to take the first topic, which is left atrial appendage exclusion, which a lot of patients undergo, it's actually only a class 2B level of C recommendation, which means that a few old men sat around the table and said, why not? Um, but there's not much evidence that it actually is effective therapy for stroke reduction. So as everyone knows, the left atrial appendage is the source of thrombus for most patients with non-valvular AFib, so non-mitral patients. About 91% will have the thrombus located in the appendage. If you're valvular or rheumatic AFib, that's a different story, only about half. And so because of this, from a mechanistic standpoint, someone a few years ago or many years ago came up with the idea, well, can we just do a percutaneous closure of the left atrial appendage occlusion? So they came up with the Watchman device. I don't know if you guys are used to this. Watchman is basically a transeptal sheath is inserted. There's a little filter that's expanded in the appendage. It's unscrewed. The filter's left in place. You're put on Coumadin for 45 days. After 45 days, if TE shows no flow between the appendage and the left atrium, then you stop the anticoagulation. So does it work? Well, if you, this is just a follow-up of a CT scan and a TE, of just a representative example. So here you have a, a TE image. You can see here, here's the appendage. There's no flow between the appendage and the left atrium. This is a CAT scan showing that there's no contrast filling into the appendage. So this is a nicely closed left atrial appendage. And they actually tested this in the PROTECT AF trial. This was a randomized trial where they compared anticoagulation versus warfarin. It was a non-inferiority trial, but if you look at the five-year outcome, and it was non-inferior to Coumadin, and if you look at the five-year outcomes, you can see that for the primary endpoint, which is stroke, systemic embolism, or cardiovascular death, it reduced that, it was a relative risk reduction of 39% in favor of the watchman, and it decreased the risk of hemorrhagic stroke by 85% over time, which makes sense because every day you're on Coumadin, you're at risk for a hemorrhagic stroke. Every day you're not is less of a risk. And if you actually look at the five-year outcomes, it actually reduced the risk of cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. A lot of this driven by the decrease in cerebral bleeds. But again, it was a non-inferiority trial, so it is now FDA approved as an alternative to Coumadin. So what about surgical left atrial appendix exclusion? So the largest study that I'm aware of was about 2,500 patients. Uh, were included who had undergone left atrial appendage closure via surgical route, and 137 of those had a full post-op TE at least a few months later, uh, which they did Doppler imaging of the appendage. And if you see the breakdown, about 52 of them underwent excision, 73 underwent suture, and about 12 underwent stapler exclusion. And there were basically three categories of failure. If you had a patent left atrial appendage, a remnant left atrial appendage, or if you had an excluded left atrial appendage with flow between the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. And if you look at the closure rates, it's not really that great. So about 75% who underwent excision actually still had some flow between a residual left atrial appendage and the left atrium. For suture exclusion, only around 25% were completely excluded, meaning 75% essentially still had flow between the left atrium and left atrial appendage. That doesn't mean that all those patients are at risk for stroke if you have a five millimeter gap between the two. And for stapler, it was 0%. So in total, only about 40% of patients in this reasonably large series, although it was published years ago, had successful left atrial appendage closure. 
the best being excision of the left atrial appendage. Overall, I'm aware of five clinical trials. Only one was randomized, but included about 1,400 patients. And to date, no trial has actually demonstrated a benefit for left atrial appendage exclusion for stroke reduction. And some of that may be because there's varying techniques for doing left atrial appendage exclusion. There's varying degrees of success within each of those techniques. So the question is if, you know, it may or may not work, and it works some of the time to exclude the appendage, but the real question is if you close the appendage, are you actually increasing the patient's risk of stroke? Is that a possibility as well? So a colleague of mine who's actually out in uh, Brazil and California, two colleagues, looked at this. And what they did is they took a series of patients who underwent in their hospital in California who underwent left atrial appendage closure from a surgical route, and they did it in paroxysmal or persistent non-rheumatic non patients. And the surgical approach was the over -so technique. And after the patients underwent the surgery, three months later, they all underwent CT scans, CT angiography, to see if there was flow between the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. <clears throat> and this is how they define the outcome. So a complete left atrial appendage ligation was basically, or complete left atrial appendage closure, was the total absence of any anatomical structure between the base of the mitral valve and the LSPV as shown here. Incomplete surgical ligation was if you had a narrow constricted left atrial appendage neck between the left atrial appendage and the left atrium. And then they defined something called a stump, which is you had greater than one centimeter residual left atrial appendage between the left atrium and the left atrial appendage. So these two would have been considered failures of closure. They enrolled 75 patients with a mean follow-up of about 48 months. 65% of them had complete left atrial appendage closure, and 35% were incomplete, which is consistent with all the other studies that I'm aware of. Within that subgroup, there was 65% were incomplete surgical ligation, so there was a neck between the, two, the left atrium and left atrial appendage, and about 35% had a stump of at least a centimeter. Again, that doesn't mean that just because you have incomplete surgical ligation or because you have a stump that you necessarily are going to have a stroke or that you necessarily have to be on Coumadin, but these are the way they quantified it. And so they follow these patients over time, and you notice here that uh, didn't uh, come properly, but a fair number of the patients still had atrial fibrillation. A fair number of the patients were on antiarrhythmics and beta blockers. And if you look at actually the, what the event rate, what you can see here is that four out of these 65 patients, or yeah, four patients had a stroke during follow-up. And you can see how that's broken down here. So there were three ischemic strokes, one TIA, one GI systemic embolization. And what happens, is, and none of those patients were on anticoagulation. So what happens is, basically, if you have a left atrial appendage stump, it seems to be okay. If you have incomplete surgical ligation, so you have that narrow neck, it appears to be that your risk of stroke is much higher if you're off of anticoagulation. Now, this was not a randomized trial. None of these were controlled for. This was whatever their doctors decided was standard of care to either continue or not continue anticoagulation. And so what they did is they actually compared their risk of stroke with what happened. So if you look at the entire cohort, the annualized risk of stroke or embolic event was 1.9%. If you look at the incomplete surgical ligation patients, their risk was 6.5%. If you look at just the patients who were not receiving oral anticoagulation who also had incomplete surgical ligation, their risk was 14.5%. And if you look at what happens if they have less than five millimeters of flow, but in that neck, the risk is 19%, which would seem to indicate that it's worse to have incomplete surgical ligation of the appendage than to do nothing at all, at least if you're going to stop Coumadin. And I think that's an important point, at least when we see these patients in follow-up, if we know the appendage was closed, but we don't actually know the status of the appendage. And that's probably, and this and the other studies that I presented, the reasons that it's given a class 2B level of C recommendation. Anyways, for this particular patient, we agreed that left atrial appendage exclusion would be reasonable at the time of surgery, but it would not necessarily obviate the need for anticoagulation. So he understood that, and he was okay with that. The next question, obviously, he asked was, what about the maze procedure? They want to do a maze on him. He's already failed three car a few cardioversions. He's failed amiodarone and sotalol. He just wants to know if it's something that should be done at the time of surgery. And the real question he's asking is, does the maze actually successfully treat atrial fibrillation in someone with persistent AFib? 
And so just for everyone's understanding, this is a, a nice image, at least for people who don't know much about AFib. This is a nice image of the left atrium. These are the pulmonary veins. Proxismal AFib originates in the pulmonary veins in most patients. That's where the trigger is, leaves the pulmonary veins, enter the atrium, and then puts someone into AFib. And this is just an example from our, our catheter ablations. So here you see here the AFib originates in the pulmonary vein, enters the atrium. What we do at least during catheter ablation is we, for proxismal patients, is we do a PVI, so we ablate around the pulmonary veins. Why does it fail? Well, it fails for a few reasons when it fails in catheter ablation. Very often you can get acute electrical isolation, so you cauterize around all the veins, but some of the, the, the tissue is actually not dead, but it's just injured. So you get a reconnection between the pulmonary veins and the atrium. And so PVI is the most common cause of failure after AF ablation. The other possibility is that someone has a recurrence after an AF ablation, and then you remap them, and their veins are still electrically isolated, but they actually have triggers that come from somewhere else other than the PV. You can have them come from the SVC, from the posterior wall left atrium, which is most common, or the coronary sinus. So back to the question of surgical ablation for atrial fibrillation during mitral valve surgery, you know, there's a, a fair number of studies on this. There's not many randomized studies. I know this was one that was done here at Mount Sinai. I believe there were two PIs from this, from this institution. But this was published in New England last year, randomly assigned 260 patients with persistent AFib who were undergoing mitral valve surgery to either surgical ablation or no ablation. After randomization, they underwent further randomization to do a pulmonary vein isolation only or a biatrial maze. All the patients underwent left atrial appendage closure, and the primary endpoint was freedom from AF at six months and 12 months. And just from an AF standpoint, you have to be careful when you interpret AF studies. Uh, a lot of studies are performed differently, and a lot of it has to do with what the <laughs> definition of AF is, which is in most trials actually 30 seconds. So 30 seconds of AFib in a catheter ablation trial is considered a failure, even if it's 30 seconds in a period of a year. And also how much monitoring that you do. The more monitoring you do, the less, the more AFib you're going to pick up. So in most um, catheter ablation trials now, it's anywhere from seven days to 10 days of Holter monitoring. In some of the earliest studies, it was just a simple EKG in the office. That's what determined if you were in sinus rhythm or not. In this particular study, it was somewhere in between. There was three days of Holter monitoring done at different time points, which seems fair. So these are the operative characteristics. You can see here they use different forms of ablation devices, unipolar RF, bipolar RF, and cryoablation. Uh, acute conduction block was achieved on almost all the patients. And here's the results. So if you look at the freedom from AF, patients did better when they had mitral valve surgery and surgical ablation. 63%. Uh, so 63% might not seem great, but it's actually quite good in a persistent AF population. I would say that's better than catheter ablation for persistent AFib. In fact, we tell most patients with persistent AFib they should expect a minimum of two catheter ablation procedures. Uh, interestingly, though, if you look at the ablation groups, the randomization during pulmonary vein isolation only versus biatrial maze, there were no significant differences, which I found to be a little bit surprising. One possibility is just a small number of patients. The other possibility is that just because you performed an ablation doesn't necessarily mean that you achieved a durable outcome. I'll give you an example here. So this is a different study in persistent patients where, and many of the studies seem to demonstrate this, that when you isolate the posterior wall, at least in persistent patients, there seems to be a benefit of it, that just not doing the pulmonary vein isolation only, but also isolating the posterior wall, the patients seem to do better. And one of the reasons, uh, which I'll show you in a slide, may, do, may be due to the fact that, again, just because you ablated the posterior wall or, or drew lines does not necessarily mean those lines are still intact months later. So this is a different study in which they took permanent AF patients. So permanent is even worse than persistent. These are basically patients that we cannot get into normal rhythm for any reasonable period of time. And they did three different ablation strategies. So they did what they called the U lesion, which the, they did pulmonary vein isolation in these two lines. They did a seven lesion, and then they did pulmonary vein isolation only. So for sinus rhythm at two years off of medications, for this group, they actually achieved sinus rhythm in 57%. In this particular group, they also achieved about 57%. For pulmonary vein isolation only, it was dismal, it was only 20%. So not very good. And one of the reasons may be, again, that 
because they just because they perform ablation didn't mean they actually got a durable lesion set. So in this same group of patients, if you actually look at the patient, so they brought back a certain segment of the patients, and they did EP studies on them. And during the EP study, they mapped the pulmonary veins, they mapped the posterior wall, the left atrium, and the right atrium, and they determined whether or not the areas that had been previously ablated still remained durably isolated. So if you look at the the, ser the seven patients, the um, what they call the seven lesion set patients, the sinus rhythm was almost 90% in those in which the lines were still intact. And it just proves that just, you know, pulmonary vein isolation and posterior wall ablation are important, but durable pulmonary vein isolation and posterior wall isolation are more important. So I think if you can achieve chronic uh, durable isolation with those patients, they're much li more likely to remain in sinus rhythm. And this is just a different example to that regard. This is a terrible image. I can't believe this actually got published in a journal, but either which way is a hand drawing. But what they did is they also took post maze patients, they remapped them all, and they determined where the reentrant arrhythmia was originating from. What was fascinating was the vast majority of arrhythmias were actually within areas that had been isolated acutely at the time of the procedure. And you can see here that 18 out of 27 is one example. The perimitral flutters were actually within the mitral flutter line. So just showing you that although they ablated there, they actually probably developed proarrhythmic state by the fact that they had incomplete ablation lines. Because for flutters, they go through an area of slow conduction. All you need is about a five millimeter or one, or yeah, five, five millimeter gap to create a slow enough area of conduction to develop an incessant atrial flutter. So in that regard, if you look at the guidelines, at least the ACCHA guidelines, they give surgical maze a class 2A recommendation for to be performed at the time of surgery for the treatment of AFib, which I think is fair. So what we recommended to him finally was that he should have his appendage excluded, that he should undergo the maze procedure, and that's what he did. So that was about two years ago. Uh, so he underwent uncomplicated mitral valve repair and biatrial maze here at Sinai. He was discharged home in sinus rhythm on warfarin. He felt great, continued oral anticoagulation for one year. We did a two-week life watch monitor. There was no evidence of AFib or a flutter. And I recommended he continue oral anticoagulation because I didn't know the status of his appendage. But he preferred to only take aspirin, and when he prefers it, that's what he does. So 15 months post-op, he came back to the office. Um, he was exercising. He felt short of breath. Came in, did an EKG. He was in uh, atrial flutter with rapid ventricular rate. I restarted anticoagulation. This time I restarted a NOAC, which is a discussion in and of itself. And over the next few months, he underwent three external cardioversions for atrial flutter. Never had fib again. It was always atrial flutter. At the time of the TE, the first one, there was no evidence of left atrial appendage to left atrium communication. It was a complete surgical ligation. So finally, he decided to come for an ablation. We did an ablation. And this is his 3D map. So just to orient everyone, this is a posterior view of the left atrium. This is a superior view of the left atrium. You can kind of see the body right here. And essentially what we do is we take a catheter, we touch the wall, it creates anatomy, and it measures voltage. So everything that's low voltage, i.e. dead tissue that has no electrical activity in it, here in this particular map is gray. Everything else that's scar or healthy tissue is a different color. So scar, it tends to be, uh, mild scar tends to be red. Healthy tissue tends to be purple. So if you look here, his entire left posterior wall of his left atrium down to the coronary sinus, which is right here, is completely isolated. His pulmonary veins are completely isolated. And each of these little dots represents a point. So there's hundreds of little points taken within that left atrium. So it's a pretty dense scar map. So it's completely isolated. Turns out that his, what I thought was atypical flutter, was actually typical flutter. When cable tricuspidismus on the right side, it was ablated, uh, terminated during ablation. So over the next six months, he had no arrhythmias. We did life watch monitoring, I believe, at least twice. We renegotiated, and he discontinued the oral anticoagulation. Uh, and the reason I chose that is because I knew his pulmonary veins remained isolated since the surgical maze, and his left atrial appendage was completely ligated. OK, so some conclusions on that. Surgical AF ablation is an effective therapy for paroxysmal and persistent AFib in patients undergoing concomitant valve or cabbage surgery. Durable PV isolation is a necessary component of surgical AF ablation. 
In most studies, the majority of patients with post-op atrial arrhythmias, excluding the immediate days after surgery, have either PV reconnection or incomplete ablation lines. Uh, we often recommend PVI alone in proxismal AF and PVI plus a posterior box lesion in persistent AFib. At least that's what we think is most appropriate. In this hospital, we rarely find PV reconnections in post-maze patients, and the posterior wall is invariably durably isolated. We actually looked at a series which we published about two years ago, or three years ago, a series of post-maze patients uh, done at other hospitals, and PV reconnection and posterior wall reconnection were almost universal. Uh, we are gonna hopefully look at our, uh, over the last three or four years, but we were talking about this yesterday, we maybe have one case or two cases of actual PV reconnection in a post-maze patient, at least within this hospital. Uh, left atrial appendage closure should reduce the risk of AF-related stroke. However, variations in technique and incomplete closures are likely one reason they have failed to demonstrate any stroke reduction benefit. So if you're okay with it, I wanna get into one other topic, uh, if we have time. Uh, and that's CRT. So this is a, a recent patient, 76-year-old uh, male, no past medical history, presented in May 2015 for syncope and complete heart block to an outside hospital. He had a transthoracic echo performed, I believe, on the day of his procedure, uh, which demonstrated normal biventricular size and function and no significant valve disease. He got a dual chamber pacemaker inserted, and he was discharged home. Over the course of the next year, outpatient follow-up was notable for a progressive decline in functional status. He developed significant exertional dyspnea and could not walk up a flight of stairs and fatigue. His EF dropped from 53 to 25%, and he developed severe mitral regurgitation. He was referred for mitral valve surgery. I actually met him in the surgeon's office. And his interrogations in the office were notable for being 100% ventricular paced, and he had no underlying rhythm. And as everyone knows, if you're RV pace, it's essentially the equivalent of having a left bundle branch block. So the options at that time that he was offered, or at least discussed, that he'd been through, were medical management only, mitral valve repair, percutaneous mitral clip, and CRT. So a little bit of background. Uh, he had, as you know, patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and EFs less than 35%. About one-third of them actually have moderate MR on their echoes, which is functional most often. And about 35% of these patients actually already have a left bundle branch block. And this creates a predicament. So if they end up in the EP's office first, they often get a BIV. Sometimes when they end up in the surgeon's office first, they end up with a mitral valve repair. But the reality is, and there's no right answer to how to treat these patients, but I'll at least make the argument for one of them, whether to do mitral valve repair or CRT first. So I don't know if you guys are used to seeing chest x-rays with bivs, but just to give you an example, this is a biventricular system. The whole idea is that you pace the basal lateral wall of the left ventricle around the same time that you pace the right ventricle. Um, because in a left bundle branch block, what happens is your lateral wall, your ventricle is activated much later and what you're trying to do is resynchronize the LV and the RV to beat at the same time. Is it effective therapy? The answer is yes. It is probably the most effective therapy that we have in EP. Everything else we do is essentially a quality of life per, um, uh, outcome. For BIVICDs, it's actually a quality of life as well as duration of life. So this is the made it CRT trial, which is the primary endpoint was, you know, um, survival free of heart failure, so they had to be alive and also not admitted for heart failure. And this was actually mild CHF patients who had EF less than 30% and a QRS greater than 130, and pretty dramatic benefits for a bi ICD compared to medical therapy alone, or compared to ICD alone, I should say. If you look at what a bi ICD does on remodeling, it has electrical remodeling as well as structural remodeling. It decreases your end diastolic volume, it decreases your end systolic volume, and increases your ejection fraction. And this was actually an interesting study on the effects of bi ICD on mitral regurgitation. So what they did is they took a whole series of patients, I think it was like 130 patients, they put bi -Vs in all of them, they biventricular paced them for three months, and then obviously they did echoes, and then they turned off the bi -Vs, and then they let them go for another few months and then repeated the echoes. You can see here that when the BIV is on, the end diastolic volume and systolic volumes come down and the MR comes down. And then when you actually turn off the BIV pacing, the end diastolic volumes start to increase as well as the MR, which is pretty impressive. 
Someone else looked at what is the impact of CRT on functional MR, and they took a large series of patients who had indications for BIVs, and echoes were performed. The BIVs were put in, and then they categorized them as either having mild functional MR baseline or moderate to severe functional MR. And what happened is, for the patients with moderate to severe functional MR, about 50% improved to either no or only mild functional MR. So it has pretty significant impacts on the degree of mitral regurgitation. What effect does that have on survival? So these patients who had improved MR after bi ICD implant, we know that response to CRT, whether or not it's end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, EF, or MR, the better that gets, the better your survival gets. And you can see here on the survival curve that the patients who had improved mitral regurgitation after bi ICD did significantly better than those who had no improvement after bi ICD. And this is obviously your baseline absent to mild MR. This is, has so much of an impact that actually, if you look at the European guidelines by VICD for patients with non ischemic cardiomyopathy, left bundle branch block, and significant mitral regurgitation, is actually included within the concept of medical therapy. So, the same way you would give them an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, they should be considered for a biventricular device. So for this particular patient, uh, the mitral valve rep repair was deferred at that time, and the patient was recommended for a CRTD system instead. We did a TTE uh, three, after three months, which was a few weeks ago, and it's demonstrated his EF was now 40 to 45%, previously 25%. He had normal LV size, so his end diastolic and end systolic volume got better, and he only had mild MR. Uh, exercise tolerance improved to basically his pre-pacemaker implant levels. And you can see here, this is a biventricular paced rhythm. How do you know that? Well, if you look at lead one, the lateral wall is being activated first. So in conclusion, patients with functional MR, low EF, and a left bundle branch block, or a high burden of RV pacing, should at least be considered for a BIV or CRT prior to valve surgery. Why? Improvements in MR may obviate the need for surgery in at-risk patients, but I think even more importantly, if the MR does persist, then you've optimized a patient before you bring them to the OR. Their end diastolic volume comes down, their end systolic volume comes down, and their EF may improve. And that's it.